Welcome to month three, everyone. I can't believe we're almost into the third quarter of 2022. Technically, it's baffling. Uh, the Magic School Bus is stopping off on the lymphatic system today. So there is some degree of continuity here, and I want everyone to start taking note of that because, you know, by the end of this entire series, everyone will have a lot uh, more accurate and a perspective of understanding body systems in isolation, but also the interconnectedness. So we started off with cellular health and systemic energy production, which I hope by this point, all of us understand the foundational principles, no energy, no life. So how does that energy get supported systemically? Well, we looked at the cardiovascular system next and we discovered that the entire purpose of the cardiovascular system is the delivery and a removal system. It's the primary delivery and removal system. So we're getting oxygen and nutrition into tissues and ultimately cells. And we're getting gases and waste material, hopefully outside of those cells back into circulation so they can be processed and removed from the body so we can be healthy, yay. So that's the foundational role. Now we're gonna look at the unsung hero of the circulatory system which isn't the lymphatic system that a lot of people like to talk about, but very few people really understand what the actual primary job of the lymphatic system is, let alone some of the cool crossover aspects and mechanisms that we're gonna look at. So from a structural standpoint, there are twice as many lymphatic vessels as there are cardiovascular vessels, meaning this system is actually a lot bigger. There's a lot more area, uh, surface area that needs to be distributed. Why? Because uh, there's no active pump in the lymphatic system. So to rely upon the pressure of the heart to pump the lymphatic system is simply not possible. So its flow is essential to health, so much so that uh, in 24 to 48 hours of stagnation, if there's a, a blockage in a lymph node or a lymphatic duct, it's over. And when I mean it's over, life is kind of awful to think about. So because it's a one-way pump, it doesn't actually have anything that's pushing it. It's like the concept of a boat on a river with no oars and no motor. It just kind of floats with the current. So looking at what may help in, uh, assist in powering the lymphatic system, well, we know it's mostly water. We know water has a very inter interesting relationship with things like light frequency. So if our body is making more energy, it's making more light. If it makes more light, the water in our body absorbs that energy. So Healthy metabolism is essential for healthy lymphatic flow because we need to do something to help generate energy to move it along. The other thing that they say is exercise is an important thing because it acts as a pump. I believe it's the outcomes of exercise that beneficially affect the lymphatic system because we're bringing more energy and heat into that area so the lymphatic system can move with the exercise alone plus the additional energy that's coming in from, from the exercise itself. We have between five to 600 lymph nodes in the body. So <clears throat> if anyone wants to locate a lymph node, just push around your neck, push around your armpits. If the camera's off, you can push around your groin. Uh, anywhere that there is um, a potential area that has a high evacuation ability, what I mean by that is a lot of pores, a lot of um, ease of sweating and removal of water, that's where the lymphatic system likes to duct things into nodes for surveillance and then get it out of the body via water loss. So even though it is technically a circulatory system, it's also a very strong part of the immune system uh, because all of the organs in the checkpoints, so the three main organs, which are the thymus, the bone marrow, and the spleen, they're essential to regulating immune function. And the four checkpoints, which are uh, the adenoids, which are in your sinorespiratory tract, your tonsils, which are in your oral tract, your galt and your malt, which we'll get into, um, which are in your digestive system, and your appendix, which is in your colon. Those are all four major checkpoints for anything that could be flowing through the lymphatic system that has to be dealt with. We'll talk about that a little bit more in further detail. So the main jobs the lymphatic system has to uphold is the fact that it is primary circulatory support. Our arteries and veins are the primary circulatory system. So this is primary support for those tissues because a massive job that the lymphatic system has to uphold is not only scan for things that may be floating around the bloodstream, but it also has to bring the liquid that we lose from the cardiovascular system delivering blood and oxygen to tissues back to the circulatory system so we don't have a massive drop in blood pressure. It's got a slow-mo nature. And I was trying to think, you know, what's a concept that explains why it's slow moving? Well, there's so many scanning and detection points. So 
Along the way, each lymphatic vessel ducts into some kind of node. If you look at the node on the right, the, load, the node has its own blood supply and there's a very highly concentrated amount of immune cells in these nodes. So when something is gonna go back into circulation, can you see why it would be a danger for not having a surveillance system? Of course, if there are pathogens, viruses, toxic material that's meant to go back into our circulatory system, that could be very harmful for the body because those can potentially get into cells. So the lymphatic system and the nodes actually help filter those things out break them down in concert with the immune system, so our body is potentially less under some kind of negative threat. And the last thing, as I mentioned, it does return extra fluid, the deficit of fluid back to the cardiovascular system. Approximately in a single day, and I have to do it in metrics, so I hope people don't take offense, 20 liters of blood will go out. Most of that blood is what's called blood plasma. 17 liters comes back to the heart. So that math doesn't check out, right? A quick math analysis was well, what's the extra three liters? The main job of the, the lymphatic system is to bring that three liters of liquid back to the cardiovascular system so we don't have massive aspects of blood loss, specifically liquid volume loss. And the distinguishing characteristics that this system has compared to the circulatory system is the checkpoints of the nodes, as I mentioned, a lot more immune support organs and immune entrainment organs. And the last thing is the lymphatic system has its own specialized cells called lymphocytes. So whenever we talk about lymphocytes, which are B cells and T cells, they're specialized immune cells that originate and circulate within the lymphatic system to perform their very specific functions. You gotta admit, this, this system is quite incredible. And if you look at those little beads, those little green nodes, those are lymph nodes. And anywhere that there is a thin, quantity of skin, you can see that the lymph nodes themselves are actually not surrounding the major organs. They're at the major sweating points of the body. So we sweat behind the knees, we sweat in the you know, crotch area, we sweat near the neck, especially when we start sweating, it's all cranial and neck, and then we sweat under the armpits. If there's something that needs to be neutralized, it's a really easy thing for the lymph node to perform its action and then duct that detoxified material back into the lymphatic system and remove it via water loss when we sweat. So sweating is a really good thing to help support the support lymphatic flow, getting outside in the sun and obviously drinking good quality water because lymph is primarily water. So the most important concept that connects to our previous talk, this is the intersection point. If we remember that blood from the heart after it's been oxygenated gets pumped out to tissues. The blood goes and delivers the nutrition and the oxygen, and it removes the waste and the carbon dioxide. And how that happens is the pressure from the heart pumping forces the liquid out of the capillaries into what's called the interstitial fluid. If you look up at that blue star, the interstitial fluid is the liquid that moves around the cells in the specific organ. Once that liquid is able to be absorbed by the cells, it takes in the good stuff and at the same time, simultaneously spits out the bad stuff. And that's where most of the gas exchange and the waste material gets absorbed and it goes back via the vein side. So it goes from the red side to the blue side and anything left over is the job of the lymphatic system to take up. So when there's issues with stagnation and lymphatic flow, what ends up happening is not only is that area becoming stagnant energetically, things that are meant to be delivered and removed from the body are staying stuck. Think about the concept of an infection that never clears. If you, you know, fall and you scab your knee and you keep picking up the scab, the scab never properly heals and it can become detrimental to the health of the skin. Similar kind of concept with the lymphatic system. It's gonna take up any of these things that our body makes as normal part of metabolism remove them from the system and ultimately bring the good clean lymph back to the blood. I finally found some really cool gift graphics that kind of show you from a mechanistic point what's happening. So you can see if you follow the arrows to absorb the extra fluid, it's got to come out of the cells and it's got to return itself to the capillary beds. And it's the pumping of the heart that allows for the pressure inside of the tissues to relieve the liquid from the cells. And once, and only once the liquid gets into the lymphatic system, it's actually called lymph. So blood plasma, interstitial fluid, and lymph are all technically the same kind of liquid, but when they are in each respective system, they have a different name. 
So the liquid being taken up from the cells, being pumped back into the lymphatic system, is mostly water and waste material. And once it gets into the lymphatic vessel, which is a better diagram right here, now it can actually become lymph. And as you can see, the structure of the lymphatic vessels are very interesting. They're kind of like veins, where they have only a single one-way flap. There's a large volume, so they can take up a lot of liquid. And as it goes through this process, regardless of where the lymph is going into the body, it all goes back eventually to the heart, ducting in through the thoracic duct. And it's this process that allows the lymphatic system to be a secondary surveillance system for our entire bodies working in concert with the immune system. I'll let everyone have a little look at this graphic to get a better depiction and understand the connection points. You see the liquid on the left-hand side, as the previous diagram showed us, goes back into the lymphatic vessel via the one-way flap. And ultimately, it gets filtered out by the nodes and eventually gets returned back into the cardiovascular system, entering the common thoracic duct. And I have to say, it is quite a remarkable system. So when practitioners are doing anything that support energy metabolism, specifically detoxification, uh, heavy metal chelation, anything of that nature, what you really want to talk to them about is how they're intervening via supporting the lymphatic system. I feel this is probably the single most understood system, and it's the one that most people kind of gloss over, especially in medical school, because it looked at a secondary system to support the cardiovascular system, which is of primary importance to energy metabolism, oxygen delivery, and what have you. But ultimately, if the lymphatic system becomes stagnant, there are a lot of issues that can go wrong because along the way, the second most concentrated quantity of immune tissue and immune cells exists within the lymph, second obviously only to the gut. And drawing those conclusions is where I feel everyone here as a, a rep to a multitude of different practitioners can provide value because we're not giving you something to make the lymphatic system flow. That's actually impossible. What makes the lymphatic system flow is a healthy body that is free of toxic material, that has adequate nutrient status, and lives in an environment as an active enough to make sure that all those systems are moving in proper concert. Because if you have poor lymphatic circulation, uh, there are some consequences. And as I mentioned, if, if it's stagnant for up to two days, um, that can mean the end of things. So poor lymphatic circulation will cause a drop in overall blood volume. Remember, if 20 liters goes out, and 17 liters goes back, um, that could be pretty problematic because if you drop blood volume, you drop blood pressure, you can pass out. Same thing with blood pressure. The medical industry jumps all over high blood pressure because we worry about the pressure causing issues to the blood flowing in the arteries and injury of the arteries and plaque formation. But low blood pressure is actually even more of a problem in some contexts because low blood pressure could cause adrenal insufficiency, nervous system dysregulation, energy metabolis metabolism deficits, and it messes up hormonal signal. If we don't have good lymphatic circulation, we have an issue with nutrient delivery and waste pickup and oxygen delivery as well. And if you look at stages one through four, this is an example of what's, what's called lymphedema. So stage one, you see on the, the right leg or the one that we're looking at that's right, you see a slight swelling. Stage four is massive lymphedema. This is where you need to go to the, the hospital and you need to basically get yourself on some kind of diuretic or else this is a major problem that could lead to the loss of that limb or potentially worse. So now that we've understood the basics of the lymphatic system as far as the structure goes, we need to understand the intersection points of different areas of the body because the lymphatic system really is one of these systemic aspects that connects to every organ, every tissue, and ultimately every cell. So in lymph nodes, we have very concentrated quantities of lymph cells, and their main job is to scan and filter. If they don't scan and filter, as I mentioned before, things that should not go back into the bloodstream can return to the bloodstream, causing an even greater immune system response and ultimately causing a systemic inflammatory response that can become sustained. So the whole idea is we're Sorry, my cat is trying to push my computer here. <laughs> um, we're removing different kinds of infections via the immune system, the immune cells themselves, but we're also trying to alert the immune system if necessary, because the lymphocytes have subcategorized types of cells. Our innate immune system, the one we're born with, those are the T cells, and the T cells are the one that engage a threat based upon something being systemically dangerous to us. 
if uh, an environmental toxin comes in and the body knows that it's not meant to be there, it's a T cell that causes the, the initial response and will ultimately resolve that initial inflammatory response. The adaptive immune system, it's a secondary immune system that we learn uh, to educate as you know, we become small children, we start to interact with our environment, we try different foods. The B cells are the ones that create antibodies. And each antibody is very specific for a different type of antigen. So if you've ever been exposed to a certain virus, typically you have antibodies to that virus. If you have been exposed to different kinds of pathogens, uh, different food sensitivities, you have antibodies to those specific food sensitivities. And the B cells and the T cells are, are working in concert to help neutralize this threat before it becomes a systemic problem. How this connects to something that we as a company have been talking about for quite some time is the concept of the cell danger response. When the immune system can't neutralize this threat and a virus or a pathogen or something, an environmental toxin gets into a cell, gets into tissues, then the entire body sounds the alarm. And that's the beginning of the generation based upon, sorry, my, <laughs> based upon what's going on with the threat that's in our systems. So in the lymph nodes is the major checkpoint for our body trying to neutralize these threats before they become a systemic problem. And this graphic is a really cool depiction of how that whole system works. So the tiny lymph uh, vessels flow to a common node and within that node is a very um, strategic combination of what are called antigen presenting cells. The antigen presenting cells identify the threat and they tell either the T cells or the B cells what to do. And ultimately an inflamed lymph node, if anyone's ever had one of these, think about when you have a sore throat a cold or a cough, that's an example of your body dealing with an active infection or what could be a systemic infection if it gets past the lymph node. If you have strong immune cells, if your immune system has enough energy, then they can deal with this threat because they have been properly trained. So if we didn't have the lymphatic system, our susceptibility to dying from all kinds of potential pathogens and viruses and infections would increase greatly. The whole system works very um, intelligently and inter interconnectedly. And the whole idea is it wants to place surveillance at the most common points of entry. If you look at most of these, um, these areas, it's either within the GI tract or within what comes through the sinus respiratory and the oral pathway. So tonsils and adenoids are anything you breathe in and anything you may swallow, anything you may eat. Because if there's nothing to scan what's coming in, then our bodies can be swallowing things that would be, would be causing a much greater problem down the line. And if we didn't have the ability to identify different things via using the thymus, the organ that educates these immune cells, we wouldn't be able to recruit the proper responses. And ultimately, once there's been a lot of detoxification and a lot of intervention from the actual lymphatic system, we need something to help filter the lymphatic system and remove it from the body in addition to filtering old worn out red blood cells, which is our spleen's job. Our spleen is actually the area with the largest concentrations of, of lymphatic tissue in the body. And its main job is to filter all the foreign material that has been intervened from the lymph nodes, but it also breaks down red and white blood cells so they can either be recycled or removed from the body. So it keeps our immune system working properly. The bone marrow is also absolutely essential because the bone marrow is where the production of all immature immune cells exists. So the bone marrow is what produces the immune cells. The thymus and the spleen are what help educate and break down and recycle the immune cells. So it's all very much uh, intelligently designed. And when it becomes broken down, it's something in our body is causing the system to work inefficiently. And I found this quite interesting. I did not know this before I did the uh, research for this lecture. The appendix actually creates a lot of lymphatic tissue, or not rather creates, contains a lot of lymphatic tissue. And one of the appendix's job is it has a massive role in keeping things that could potentially breach the intestinal wall, which means the, the appendix is an important organ in helping to prevent leaky gut problems that can mean infection circulating systemically throughout the body. And a question I ask all of my clients, do you have your tonsils and do you have your appendix? Why I ask that is very simple. I know that there's been some degree of infection or some kind of infectious inflammatory load 
that has overwhelmed their immune system's capacity to maintain balance. So if, if you're working with clinicians, ask them how many people they see who have immune inflammatory problems don't have an appendix or they've had their tonsils out at a young age. When you remove these major checkpoints, you lose some degree of efficacy based upon what the lymphatic system does. So ideally they wanna have some contingency plans when it comes to supporting their patients, making sure that we can support the immune system and regulate inflammation potentially due to the fact that we've lost some degree of, of effect from the natural nodes and checkpoints that have been designed into the system. To connect the dots, this is how this whole thing comes together. So remember the blood from the veins comes back to the heart. It gets pumped out to the pulmonary circuit. The pulmonary circuit is where it goes to the lungs. It gets reoxygenated, gets delivered to tissues, goes to the capillary bed, and that's where all the magic happens, that gas exchange, and it's from the capillary bed that the liquid is taken up by the lymphatic vessels because they're very much intertwined. It goes through its very ser various series of nodes and checkpoints, meaning the lymph nodes and the organs in the lymphatic system, and ultimately being ducted back into the thoracic duct near the heart. So the system starts the process over again. So you thought learning the steps of the cardiovascular system was complex. Now we've added an entire <laughs> secondary system and everything meshes together. But it wouldn't be complete unless we made a little stop off in the gut. So we have different aspects of lymphatic or lymphoid tissue in the gut. And a lot of people here have heard these things. There's the malt and the galt. So the overarching interconnection is the malt, meaning mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue. I'll make this uh, an important point to talk about because anywhere there's a mucosal lining, there's a malt. So it's not just in the gut. There's a malt in anywhere. There's mucus being the, the, the respiratory tract, the lungs. So when we're helping to support people with enzymes, for example, that have an effect at mucosal linings, we're directly supporting the malt. If we're talking about the gut, which is the gut-associated lymphatic tissue, that's the one that is very specifically targeted to the small intestine and secondarily the large intestine. I want to ask someone, why would there be a high concentration of lymphatic tissue based upon everything we just talked about located directly at the gut? Why would the small intestine be the principal site of the immune system and a high concentration of lymphatic tissue? They've been taught from the, th the thymus, the tonsils, the appendix, that it's absolutely necessary to destroy anything bad before it gets there. Bingo. And what is the digestive system's principal job? It's to digest and absorb. So it is the most likely site of entry for something that could be problematic to the body that would recruit the immune system. So it is this entry point that allows all kinds of different specialized tissue of the lymphatic system to be very purposefully distributed in the small intestine because it has to surveil everything that's coming in the gut. So the main jobs of the gallt, it prov provides a vast surveillance of the gut and 26 feet of small intestine. Um, every villi technically has a lymphatic innervation called a lacteal. Uh, it provides a mode of tolerance when we are young children and we're being introduced to environmental compounds and to food for the first time. Uh, it is these tissues that allow our immune systems to understand what's food and what's good for us and understand what's bad for us and it entrains our immune cells and it helps to entrain our microbiome to be able to sense potential threats and understand how to neutralize them before they become a deeper problem, as Larry mentioned. Because the whole idea of threat assessment needs to be followed up with threat intervention. And it's here where a lot of these immune cells can create these things called cytokines. Cytokines release chemical messengers that activate inflammatory factors. And inflammation, we have to remember, is the first stage of healing, but it's chronic inflammation that never gets resolved that eventually becomes the problem of what generates leaky gut, what promotes dysbiosis, what promotes digestion and absorption insufficiencies, because the body in this last line is based upon understanding how the system is designed. The body is always trying to stop all potential threats from getting into systemic circulation because when they do, it gives the body more work to do 
it takes energy away from health and it dedicates energy trying to not become sick. Say it again. When threats get into the system, the body takes energy away from being able to support and sustain health, maintain health, and will redistribute it to systems that try and neutralize us from not getting sick. That's why the lymphatic system and the gut specifically are so important. But there's a secondary aspect to this, and this is a really interesting area that I want to dive into a little bit more on my own. The lymphatic system plays a major role in the digestive process. You know, digestio, digestion 101 is that fats do not get into the body the same way carbohydrates and proteins do. And there is some research that is looking between the interplay of the lymphatic vessels and the microbiome in terms of how these lymphatic vessels are formed. So in the early years, uh, a child who has a healthy microbiome will form better lymphatic connections, likely based upon the gut lymphatic interplay there. And the lacteals, if they're not properly formed, may actually be additionally or excessively leaky. Because if fats are going into the lymphatic system, my question is what else is going into the lymphatic system? We talk about leaky gut all the time. We talk about things translocating past the epithelial barrier, getting into the bloodstream, and now we have systemic metabolic endotoxemia. Well, my opinion, based upon what I've read and just looking at this whole process, there's probably an aspect of that same context or that same pattern that exists within the lymphatic system because fats get packaged into these little things called chylomicrons. So when we digest fats properly, we mix fat with bile and enzymes. So we emulsify the fats with bile. This allows the fatty acids to be acted upon by enzymes. And they don't just go into the bloodstream or into the lymphatic system by themselves. What happens when you put olive oil and balsamic vinegar together in a, in a glass or a bowl? They separate. <clears throat> so fats are packaged into these little transport vesicles called chylomicrons. And it stands to reason that potentially toxic pathogenic bacteria, their metabolites, endotoxins, exotoxins, all these things are very likely able to get into these chylomicrons too if we don't have a good gut lymphatic connection or if our gut's excessively dysbiotic and poorly functioning, we may be entering things into our lymphatic system perpetually that then that system is having to filter out. Does that make sense? I believe this is happening with a lot of small children, people with chronic tonsillitis, chronic inflamed um, uh, lymph nodes in different parts of the body, there's something that's getting into the lymphatic system that the nodes are having to deal with. And if the immune system gets chronically overburdened, it's the same story no matter where the entry point or what the process. When the system loses energy to deal with a threat or the threat overwhelms the system's capabilities, we have a breakdown. Because all of the organs of detoxification, so the, the GI system itself, the liver, gallbladder, uh, the kidneys, everything has a, a connection point to the lymphatic system because the lymphatic system is helping to clear out any secondary waste materials that are not able to be filtered by those systems primarily. So the lymphatic system has a lot of heavy lifting to do. And you know, we as clinicians never really think about it because you know, research pushes us to focus on this or that. We look at things in silos but we don't necessarily always look at the interconnectedness of this whole thing we call a human body. And I think that's where the value is when it comes to speaking to our clinicians, because we may not have a lymphatic support product that is stated on the label to be a lymphatic support product, but we have things that help deal with digestion, absorption, inflammatory interventions, and also getting the body back into a state of health. So indirectly, this is actually what we're doing. And I just had to show this graphic because look at the beautiful design when all of these systems are interwoven together. Exactly, that's, that's my reaction too. And all of these organs are very much tied. This, this shows me personally that I think the best clinicians are the ones that look at the body. And if you look at some of the concepts of traditional Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Eastern medicine, they didn't necessarily know all the biochemical reactions that we do that happen in specific organs, but they understood the interconnectedness of the whole thing. And it's in that interconnectedness 
that they were able to make decisions for the whole body. I think the ability for us as a company to start introducing these topics of conversation to give people a more global perspective, to get out of the myopic focus of being an organ specialist or a body system specialist, understand how the cardiovascular system and the lymphatic system interplay, and you'll understand a lot more about inflammation and why the body responds it, the way it does to something like leaky gut. So I know you guys all had questions, and I know Raphael, I don't know how you got in my presentation. So, you know, so Roland, if I may, you're saying that enzymes and probiotics will directly support the lymphatic system. Well, not necessarily directly, but I want to introduce, I'm glad you asked Raphael, I wanted to introduce this as a concept, a key perspective. So your question was beautiful. It was so eloquently put. We are doing what I call indirect support. I think this is the way in to starting this conversation. And you might actually elucidate uh, the fact that a lot of clinicians don't necessarily have the grasp on the lymphatic system that maybe they want to or that they should for dealing with some of the conditions that they do. So if we're supporting the lymphatic system to the gut, we know that it's digestively connected. We know it's dysbiotically connected. And we, we know that those two processes have to be regulated for us to not have an increased burden on the lymphatic system. How can I say that more simplistically? If we're not breaking down our food, that is going to stress the lymphatic system. Why? Because you may have inflammatory proteins from food not completely being digested or from the environment that get into the bloodstream that need to then be filtered into the lymph and we stress our lymph nodes. Secondarily, if we have high levels of pathogenic dysbiosis, what's the downstream consequence? Well, if they are causing a degradation in the mucosal barrier, which means that their metabolites or their toxic remnants are getting into both the cardiovascular circulatory system and the lymphatic circulatory system, we are driving some degree of translocation of something that is going to cause an inflammatory response. That equals immune stress. And if we're not able to properly digest our fatty acids, we're not going to be able to properly absorb our fatty acids, which also will cause a long latent deficiency in fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin K, which are probably the vitamins that are most um, inadequately represented in people's physiology, but very rarely do you test for them. So if we deal with the, the digestive system, we're dealing with the fact that we're lessening the burden of downstream toxicity. But how about enzymes? Well, at this point, everyone knows that what an enzyme does is it works with the immune system in a systemic context when taken systemically, not to support digestion, to help resolve inflammation. So how do we utilize that in, in a lymphatic context? Well, as I said, in the malt, there is a highly concentrated aspect in lymphatic tissue. So anywhere there's a mucosal barrier, there's the need for lymphatic support. Anywhere there's a liquid medium, there's need for lymphatic support. And then Jason will add context to this after. You know, we talk about enzymes being able to freely circulate in the cardiorespiratory system they're probably able to get into the lymphatic system and do some work in those lymph nodes and aim to alleviate some of the stresses off of the T cells and the B cells. Anytime there's waste that needs to be removed, the lymphatic system does play to a degree some kind of disposal role. Uh, so taking the burden off of some of those organs the lymphatic system relies upon to regulate itself, enzymes can play a role there in theory. Um, and anywhere inflammation must be resolved. We know that the principal site of inflammatory response and immune activity is in the gut. Secondarily, we're talking bone marrow and lymphatic system. So now we're getting into the, the, the systemic picture of understanding what the body is really trying to do when it's filtering out or assessing and intervening with the threat and how we as practitioners, reps and clinicians can make better decisions to help support these people. So that was a lot of information. I'm sure there, there will be some follow-up questions.